are at the bottom of the sea. All this proved was that an old battleship with no crew on board, no anti-aircraft guns and not manoeuvring could be sunk by aircraft. And in the end, actually, Mitchell failed in his intention to form an independent American air service as, as we had in Britain. The near loss of their air wing to Mitchell convinced Navy leaders to get serious about aviation. Aboard the carrier Langley, air operations went into high gear under the orders of Captain Joseph M. Reeves. And what Reeves discovered was that what a carrier needed to be able to do to be an effective fighting unit was to send off a lot of aircraft at once. And he was the one who changed operations on Langley and uh, reduced the amount of time it took to get an airplane off and the amount of time it took to get an airplane back. And it was under his supervision and his prodding and uh, the questions that he asked that Langley's flight deck crew was able to pioneer the method that was used so successfully uh, in World War II to make American aircraft carriers very powerful striking units. To be able to launch and recover aircraft quickly, Captain Reeves introduced the deck part. A plane returning from a mission would be pushed forward to the front of the flight deck. A barrier would then be raised behind the aircraft. If the next aircraft came in and missed the wire, it would hit the barrier, not the airplane. And so what would happen is that the planes would, would fill up the front end of the flight deck, then the barrier would be lowered, the airplanes would be pushed back to the end of the flight deck, rearmed, refueled, and they were now ready for another takeoff and another strike. The other thing that Reeves understood was that Langley had to operate a lot of aircraft. So when he took command of the air forces in the Pacific, Langley was operating no more than 14 aircraft. And so under his leadership, Langley carried not just double the 14. There were times when Langley operated 42, triple that number, yeah, a deck packed. By the winter of 1925, USS Langley was laying the foundations for the practical use of aircraft at sea. Operational patterns developed on USS Langley are still in evidence today. A good example is the use of colored jerseys to clearly identify roles on the noisy flight deck. Brown jerseys are worn by plane captains. Red jerseys for those handling ordnance. Blue for plane handlers. Green for maintenance. Yellow for launch and recovery officers. Almost as soon as we knew what a carrier was, they were playing with them in, in the game floor. And because you could try different technology before it really worked, they had a sense of what they could do. For example, they had a sense that large numbers of airplanes could make a difference. By 1929, we have two very large carriers, and we discovered they can successfully raid places. For example, we run an exercise that year in which they raid the Panama Canal. In 1929, Fleet Problem 9 was the first fleet problem where you had the two big carriers, Lexington and Saratoga, exercising with the fleet. And there was a proposal by Admiral Reeves, who was in command of those ships, that they be used in attacks on land targets. He took his carriers out to sea at the first day of the exercise and disappeared. His task was to attack the Panama Canal defences um, in support of, of you know, his, his ground forces and so on. But he disappeared and nobody knew where he was. What he'd actually done was take his, his guys well out to sea have a refreshing period of a few days, and then turn round, full steam ahead, head for the Panama Canal um, on the day when everybody else was winding down and the defenders were going to be having a few beers. On this uh, flight, we launched from 200 miles at sea. We caught the defenders on shore, completely unprepared, proceeded to our targets uh, on attack. Across the isthmus, the Pedro Miguel locks on the Pacific side. It's bumpy, pretty bumpy air up there now. Here is the Gatton Dam, which we hope to torpedo and accomplish our purpose. It was a very successful, completely successful attack. When it was over, the order was issued to return to the carriers. In the meantime, the carriers had steamed at full speed back toward the target to recover their aircraft.
afterward, there were people who said that this was a, a stroke of genius. If you go through the records, what you find is that there was a shortage of fuel in the force that Reeves was a part of. And it was actually uh, the only way he could attack the canal effectively using the big carrier was to break it off from the battleships and the rest of the force. Nevertheless, it was a great success. Uh, it gave a lot of confidence to the Navy's aviators. It was a couple of years before it dawned on the Americans that he'd actually hit upon the really specialist aspect of, of naval aviation, that you could turn up completely at surprise out of thousands of square miles of sea and, and deliver a telling blow with, with, with your airplanes. The first such telling blow in wartime would come out of the Mediterranean sky. On the night of November 11th, 1940, from the decks of the British carrier HMS Illustrious, 21 swordfish of the fleet air arm set off for Taranto Harbor, where Mussolini's fleet lay at anchor. I was an observer in 815 Squadron, which was one of the swordfish squadrons in Illustria. She carried two. And we were in the Mediterranean running convoys, and uh, the Italian fleet, which was at least twice as strong as us, uh, blankly refused to come out and fight. So the decision was taken that if he wouldn't come out and fight, well, we would go in and fight, and the swordfish were, were sent in. It was a night attack, of course, because uh, the one thing that we were scared stiff of in a swordfish was any enemy fighter in daylight. If we did any raid, the poor swordfish at uh, 90 knots was uh, uh, sitting up for any land-based fighter, and so we, we did everything at night. The first time we saw Taranto, we saw the gunfire first, because they hadn't got radar. Nobody had got radar in those days, but uh, they had sound location and they could pick us up at about 40 miles, we knew that. Although we, people talked about, oh yes, you got surprised, but we didn't because 40 miles was 20 minutes, uh, getting on for half an hour to get there in a swordfish, so they were well prepared. The swordfish swarmed across Toronto Harbour at low level in order to drop their torpedoes. They had to fly below 100 feet and below 100 knots so the torpedoes wouldn't break up on impact with the water. They braved a ceaseless barrage of anti-aircraft fire. I think we got away with it simply because most of this stuff was, uh, was going over the top of us. And you could hear it and you could smell it and you could see it and it was like uh, a ring of people shooting rockets at you all the time, I suppose. We were slightly disappointed when we came back to the ship because we didn't see the great big fountain of water that you would expect from a torpedo hitting the side of a ship. And it wasn't until the next day that the RAF went over and, and photographed the results that they came back and, and showed us the photographs and we all rather cheered up then and thought it was worth a libation, you know. <laughs> it was a resounding success. The British raid had disabled three battleships, a cruiser, and two destroyers. Half of Italy's fleet traded for the loss of only two swordfish. On the other side of the world, the Japanese took notice. The Japanese took a very great interest in what had happened at Taranto in November 1940. They didn't know if torpedoes could run effectively in harbour if they were dropped by aircraft in relatively shallow water. Taranto showed what could be done in harbour with a torpedo-carrying aircraft, and it certainly helped catalyse the idea that a major attack against an enemy fleet in harbour was a practical proposition. The success of the Taranto attack may very well have convinced them that they could do a Pearl Harbour assault, the, the more interesting issue about Taranto is once you saw this happen, 